Thank you, Carol, very much. Do please keep open that uh, page in 1 Timothy 5, 1193. And before we study it, uh, let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, may your written word be our rule, your Holy Spirit be our teacher, and your greater glory be our supreme concern. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us on Sunday mornings over the past few months, you'll know that we've been working through uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy, in which the Apostle is writing to this young leader of the new church in Ephesus, uh, where things were not as always as they should be. And Paul is concerned particularly about two things for the church at Ephesus, sound teaching and sound leadership. The two go together. And here in chapter 5, Paul returns to instructions about the elders, verse 17. The church leaders, who to us would include the clergy, but are not limited to just them. And the sad fact was that at Ephesus, the church was off course because of poor leadership. Just as we saw last week that there were many widows who were on the support list who shouldn't have been, so tragically there were people in church leadership who shouldn't have been either. And Paul understands just how damaging and corrupting poor leadership can be in a church. And that gives Paul's warnings in these verses a remarkably contemporary feel. I've divided the last nine verses of chapter 5 into three main sections. There's, a, there's an outline on the back of the service sheet if you want to follow the route as we go. So firstly, paying the elders the issue of reward, verses 17 and 18. Paul begins in verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church. The original is actually stronger more like the elders who rule the affairs of the church. So the first shock this morning is, yes, leaders are meant to lead. So we shouldn't be surprised or irked when they do. Indeed, we should be disappointed if they don't, if they don't chart a vision for the church's future, if they don't lead in preaching and teaching, as Paul states at the end of the same verse. And because of their leadership role, they are, says Paul, worthy of what he calls double honor. But let's just be careful. Paul isn't saying something is just as generalized as sort of support your local vicar. It's easy to miss one important word. The elders who rule the affairs of the church well... What Paul says here is support the elders who are doing the right job well and by implication don't support the ones who aren't. In his memoirs the satirical broadcaster Clive James talks thus uh, of a clergyman he knew. The dean was a picture of inactivity. As he sat in his wing back chair expending just enough energy to keep his pipe alight. No, says Paul, be discriminating as to whom you afford honour. So what does Paul mean by double honour? Well, first the word honour comes from the same word from which we derive the word honorarium. And so at the very least, this will mean a proper salary and adequate expenses. Now, as soon as we start talking about reward and money, some will say, well, this sounds a bit worldly. Surely there are dangers with money. Well, of course, there are. But at a starting salary of £17,000 a year for a Church of England vicar, I doubt there's a stampede into the ordained Anglican ministry for the money. And proper reward is biblical. Verse 18, Paul quotes from both the Old Testament and from Jesus. But second, honour, of course, means respect. And what will respect look like? 
Well, it will determine how we speak to and about our ministers. And if we don't pay our ministry team properly, it means that we don't respect their work. And when that's the gospel's work, that's unbiblical. So here's a particular challenge to those of us who are church wardens, treasurers, church council members. Is the gospel work of our ministry team being properly rewarded? Are we good to them? Do we look after them properly? And for all of us as church members, let's take every opportunity to show that our ministry team are valued and respected and honoured. Let's be generous, not only in our financial rewards, but also in what we say to them and what we do for them. Let's commit ourselves to pray regularly for them as they fulfill their God-given roles of preaching and teaching. Let's show them that double honour which is their biblical due. Secondly, disciplining the elders. The issue of rebuke, verses 19 to 21. Well, sadly, at Ephesus in Paul's day, as sadly in some churches of our own day, not all were deserving of honour. And so what we have in these verses is the biblical grievance procedure for the church. And here Paul has a two-word mantra for dealing with accusations against church leaders. Caution and courage. First in verse 19, Paul advocates caution. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses, he writes. And once again, Paul is basing his teaching on well-established Old Testament truths. It's what God laid down in Deuteronomy 19, and then it's what Christ himself taught in Matthew 18. And why this caution? Well, because godly church leaders are especially vulnerable to gossip and false accusation. Here's John Calvin on the subject. None, he writes, are more exposed to slander and insult than godly ministers. They may perform their duties correctly and conscientiously, yet they never avoid a thousand criticisms. And this happens not only because a higher standard of integrity is required from them, but because Satan makes us overly credulous so that without any investigation, we eagerly condemn our pastors whose good name we ought to be defending. And it's also worth remembering that because our pastors are at the sharp end of relationships, especially in pastoral work, it's right that they should be protected from gossip. But after caution, we need courage. Verse 20, those who sin, or more accurately, those who persist in sin, are to be rebuked publicly. And what does the church of today so often do? Hush it up have a quiet word and then send the errant pastor on his way for personal reasons often to continue his sin in another church and it leaves behind a sense of injustice of gossip of confusion in the congregation because nobody knows what's really happened but much more importantly no lessons are learned because this public rebuke of which Paul speaks is not for embarrassment, but for example. We need to read all of verse 20. Those who persist in sin are to be rebuked publicly, and why? So that others may take warning, or more literally, so that others may stand in fear. And it has to be said that we've often lost our nerve today I think on church discipline it all seems so dogmatic so authoritarian so intolerant for decades 
There have sadly been in our own Church of England those ministers who have voiced their disagreement with fundamentals of the Christian faith, as well as those who have openly flouted the Bible's teaching on marriage and sexual ethics. And yet such ministers have continued in their posts, often senior ones. And let's not think that sex is the only disciplinary problem the church faces, or that it's particularly worse than any other. To God, all sin is sin. And what's at stake here is the credibility of the church and God's holy reputation. How can we proclaim the truth and yet live a lie? And that's why this is so important. Verse 21, Paul writes to Timothy, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions. So here's another challenge for us. Do our ministry team feel safe and secure among us? Can they be confident about their integrity and their reputations in our hands? Do we support our church leaders when they have to exercise biblical discipline? Can they know that their flock are godly and not gossips? Let no one go home from this church to a Sunday lunch of roast vicar. So Paul has talked about paying the elders, the issue of reward, disciplining the elders, the issue of rebuke. Now thirdly, choosing the elders, the issue of recruitment. Verses 22 to 25. Question, how are we to identify and appoint people of proven Christian character to leadership positions in the church? Answer, verse 22, slowly. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, writes Paul, in a reference to the ordination or setting aside of the leaders of the church for preaching and teaching. The problem in Ephesus was a simple one, speed or haste. You see, there must have been lots of new Christian groups springing up and so a need of lots of new church leaders. Timothy must have been inundated with recommendations. So-and-so would be great. Aristarchus is a good sort, just the kind we need. Julius preached a cracker of a sermon last Sunday. He'll do. They're appointed, and then disaster. Verse 24. The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. But warns Paul, the sins of others trail behind them. So one reason to be cautious in appointing Christian leaders is that we're awfully good at hiding our sinful selves. If you'll pardon the illustration, we're often rather like slugs in the garden. You don't really notice them when they're there. What you notice is the damage they leave behind and that telltale slimy trail. The sins of others, says Paul, trail behind them. But in verse 25, Paul gives another reason for caution. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden or cannot remain hidden. So these two verses describe four kinds of people. There are the blatant sinners who we trust and pray can be easily ruled out. But then there are the cover-up specialists, and these are sadly going to be very common in the church, uh, where one often finds a very sophisticated kind of sinner. Then thirdly, there are the clearly godly, whose lives shine with strong gifts and servant hearts. But fourthly, there are what we might call the hidden godly, whose good deeds are done in secret and take much longer to be revealed. <clears throat> 
Think of the lesson Samuel had to learn while searching out God's chosen successor to Saul in 1 Samuel 16. And when Samuel saw Eliab, he thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. And so David was chosen, not because of his height, not because of his good looks, or his first-class university degree, or even his membership of all the right evangelical groups. No, but because, as the scriptures tell us, he was a man after God's own heart. And if we are incautious and we are guilty of appointing or putting forward for appointment those who are not people after God's own heart. Then in the second part of verse 22, Paul warns us that we will be sharing in their sin. It's not so much guilt by association as guilt by appointment. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, says Paul, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So here's a third challenge for us. Do we provide the time and the opportunity for potential leaders to reveal their true selves? Do we act cautiously in matters of appointment to Christian leadership? Is the Church of England's process of discernment for Christian ministry sufficiently rigorous and cautious? From my own experience of it some years ago, it seemed as if they would have endorsed a ham sandwich for ordination if it had been sufficiently bland. Are we looking for the right things? And are we prepared to see spiritual gold in others, even where there's no glitter? Well, that's covered the three issues Paul raises regarding the church elders, the issues of reward, rebuke, and recruitment, but we're not quite done yet, for there are still two matters to consider, though briefly. I'm sure it won't have gone unnoticed that so far I've managed to dance delicately around verse 23. It's kind of an aside. Indeed, some versions place the verse in brackets, not because Paul didn't write it, he clearly did, but because it's a kind of digression, but an important one. Yes, Christians are allowed to drink wine. Indeed, if you remember back in chapter 4, it was the false teachers who were going around banning things without scriptural warrant. Now, let me say here very clearly that there are, however, some very good reasons to decide yourself to abstain from alcohol. It's just that biblical authority is not one of them. But those who may be overly fond of quoting this verse should notice what it says. And also notice the six-lettered adjective that precedes the word wine. It's little. A little wine. Paul is not advocating boozing. Far from it. What he is addressing is what might have become the norm for an elder and saying to Timothy, don't get too hung up about it. Use a little wine for the sake of your health as a tonic, as a restorative, what Dick, Dick Lucas so beautifully calls a cordial for a fainting minister. Which leads us with those first two verses of chapter 6. Now let's just remember the context here. Paul has just been dealing with the rules for Christian living in the home and in the family, in the church, and now he turns to the workplace. We haven't here time to go into the whole issue of slavery and its appearance in the Bible. But in the time we have left, I just want us to apply these two verses to us, living in the 21st century, and applying them as biblical principles for acting Christianly in the workplace or wherever God has put us. First, when it comes to honoring the boss, the Bible doesn't give a let-out clause for bad employers. In verse 1, 
Paul says that we are to consider our masters, our bosses, worthy of full respect. Indeed, the implication is that your boss may not actually be worthy of it at all. That he or she may be incompetent, immoral, unreasonable, overbearing, rude, aggressive. I once had the school's deputy headmaster throw a bunch of keys at me because I suggested he'd been rude to a colleague. Yet he was still deserving of my full respect in the workplace. And why? Because God has placed your boss in their position of authority. And notice also in verse 2 that having a Christian boss means merely that we should offer even fuller respect. And do you see the reason Paul gives for all this at the end of verse 1? It's so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. And so a second truth in these verses is this, that a Christian who gives anything less than their very best at work puts Jesus Christ in a bad light. For anyone who calls themselves a Christian represents Christ to a watching world. So every time a Christian at work makes a delivery, grades an exam paper, turns in a project, hands in an expenses claim, takes care of a patient, mops the floor, serves a customer, or decides it's time to leave work and go home, we're making some kind of a statement about who Jesus is. Those of us of a certain age may, rem may remember singing in our more youthful days a Christian song which had this chorus, They are watching you, marking all you do, hearing the things you say. Let them see the Saviour as he shines in you. Let his power control you every day. It's probably not very exalted poetry, but it's spot on as advice for Christian living in a godless world, where every Christian, each one of us, is on the mission field. Let me close with this story. Someone who is now himself in full-time Christian ministry tells of his earlier life working in a large uh, merchant bank office in London. One day, he remembers, I felt I should go to one of my uh, boss, one of my colleagues who was not a Christian and invite him to the Christmas carol service so that he would hear an evangelistic address. So I went to his office and handed him an invitation card and asked him if he'd like to come along. I was met by a stream of abuse and profanity. I returned to my office not only shocked but questioning as to why God had put seemingly such an unhelpful thought into my mind. Some ten years or so later, now a full-time minister, he accepted an invitation to speak at a neighbouring church. And by the way, in case you think you can see where this story is going, it isn't. Afterwards, a man came up to me, he said, and said, I want to thank you so much for the part you played in my wife and I becoming Christians. I run a carpet laying business. And one day, years ago, I was laying a carpet at the firm you used to work at. You came into this person's office and I was working on the floor, the other side of the partition. Neither of you could see me. And you invited this chap to a carol service and he was really abusive to you. Well, I heard about the, you mentioned the church, rescued the invitation from the waste paper basket, took my wife along to the carol service, and now we're both Christians. So here's our final challenge. To share the Christian gospel with our neighbors and co-workers requires no special qualifications, gifts, or college training. There's no separate recruitment procedure. We need not even be overly cautious. And the rewards, well, they are far more than we can even ask or imagine. But there is a commission, a great commission. And wherever God has put us, whether in full-time Christian ministry or at home, in an office, in a school, 
a retirement home, a hospital, in our local community, God calls and equips each one of us to live and speak for him. And so Paul would say to each one of us this morning, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus to keep these instructions. Let's reflect on that for a moment and I'll lead us in a prayer. A verse from our final hymn, Go forth and tell, O Church of God, arise, go in the strength which Christ your Lord supplies. Go till all nations his great name adore, and serve him Lord and King forevermore. Lord God, may that be our daily prayer wherever you have placed us, and we ask it for your glory. Amen. <laughs>